everybody. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. So glad to have another special guest here today. I have the best job in the world when it comes to this because I get to talk to my friends and colleagues. And what's really cool, the secret about these interviews is I always learn something just like you. So I will, um, I'm sure that from Dr. Dempsey today, we'll learn um, some great things about MCAS. Before we start and before I introduce her formally, just a little bit of background. You can find me in all kinds of blog and information from the last 10 years at jillcarnahan.com. Um, if you need any products or services, you can find those at Dr. Jill Health. Dot com, And you can find this episode, which is actually, I think, 101, 102, and uh, all the other ones on my YouTube channel, which is just under my name. And you can also listen in your car as you're walking or hiking or wherever you're uh, doing activities on anywhere you listen to podcasts. So find us on Stitcher or iTunes or wherever. Today, I am just absolutely honored to have a guest that I highly respect who's been publishing some amazing work. Today, we're going to talk about some of those papers. She has been putting out um, incredible information. We were just talking right before we got on here how important uh, now more than ever the message of functional integrative uh, medicine. Sometimes I call it medical mystery solving because so many of you listening and so many of our patients, and if you're a practitioner listening, you know, these are people who are coming to your clinic with very, very complex chronic issues that are mysteries for the most conventional uh, doctors. We're both trained in conventional medicine. Um, however, what we realized um, is that sometimes there's more, there's more than just what we we're taught. I always feel like the foundation I, I have in my medical training is critical to making good diagnosis and treatment and um, changing medicine and shifting it. However, there's more. And today we're going to talk about more, especially in the realm of MCAS, um, which many doctors either know a little bit about mastocytosis, which we were taught in medical school. And today we'll go into all the differences between the different types. How do we diagnose it? Um, how do we treat it? And everything you wanted to know about MCAS. But before I start, I want to introduce my guest, um, Dr. Tanya Dempsey, um, medical doctor. She's um, board certified by Holistic Medical Association as well. She um, is a, received her MD degree from John Hopkins University School of Medicine and her Bachelor of Science from Cornell University. She completed her internal medicine residency at New York University Medical Center, and she's currently a community staff member of Greenwich Hospital in Greenwich, Connecticut. So uh, Lyme country, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Which we'll probably talk about infections too. Out in that oh room. yeah, yeah, cover it all. Yep. Mm -hmm. In 2011, she founded um, Armog Integrative Medicine, which has evolved into the AIM Center for Personalized Medicine, a destination practice in Purchase, New York, which focuses, as we just said, on complex multi-system diseases. Um, and again, we were both just talking about how we need more doctors and we're both passionate about training and teaching because this is an epidemic and um, patients are getting sicker and sicker. Um, she has published in so many different, um, uh, she's been an international speaker, writer, keynote for the International Congress on Natural, Nation, I'm sorry, Natural Medicine in Melbourne, Australia, featured on Fox, um, New York Times News, Reader's Digest, Huffington Post, The Observer, New York Post, and countless other media outlets. And I won't read all of the publications, but she is a well-published author. We are gonna talk specifically about some of the recent papers that you've published, because I think the data is gonna be fascinating and interesting to our listeners. Um, so I love to start with, first of all, welcome, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And then the second, where I wanna start is just your story. How did you get into functional medicine? We're both MDs, very conventionally trained. And we, you know, I, I like you, we love our background. It's, it's a great foundation, but we've gone broader, right? We've gone wider, we've gone deeper. How did you get to where you're at now and in the integrative realm um, of medicine? You know, like all of us in this, in this world, uh, in the functional medicine world, you know, we've all had our, our, our journeys. I actually have always been interested in a more holistic view on health. And I was sort of raised that way. I sort of remember back, um, I was a teenager and I had a pimple and my mother consulted her little vitamin Bible. I love and said, it. Yeah, oh, you need zinc, you know? And I would take zinc or whatever it was <laughs> and it would work. You know? um, but but my, I grew up in that sort of mindset of like, maybe there's a natural way, maybe it was the food, maybe it was something else. So I, I, I had that part of me going into medical school what happened was I sort of found that I had to really split, you know, kind of dichotomize my, my existence. So 
I was living this life where I was thinking about my body and what I was putting in it and the environment and, and, you know, the nutrients. And then I was studying science and medicine and there wasn't a lot of overlap. There wasn't ability to really overlap, but I would walk around with this vitamin book in medical school and every, everyone would be like, so what do we take? You know? And I mean, I'm simplifying functional medicine, of course, not just about right. vitamins, but it was just about the fact that I was sort of that this was a secret that the way I had to think about health and, and, um, and lifestyle and all that. And then what we did in medical school and then training. And so when I went into training, you know, it was all about, you know, that people have high blood pressure, you put them on blood pressure medicine. I wanted to talk to them about what else was going on. I wanted to understand the links between the rest of their life, not just their lifestyle and stressors, which are obviously very, very important, but also other things that were connecting, you know, maybe they had uh, stomach pains and maybe they all had other conditions. And I always understood that there had to be a connection, but our training was you treat that in isolation. They have stomach pain. You send them to the GI doctor, you know, you send them to all the specialists and it started to get really, really um, more, more and more difficult to sort of confine my practice to doing that. And I started spending more time with patients and then I would get reprimanded my bosses, you know, you're spending too much time, you're not billing enough, you know, are yes. you says, you're not writing enough statins, you're not writing enough Lipitor. And true story, there at one point there was, they were docking us first a dollar a patient and then $10 a patient if the patients had cholesterol over 200. Oh. They were docking our pay oh if our God. patients had cholesterols over 200. Right. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making it up. Okay. That's like a true story. Well, so that was the last okay. straw. I yeah. said, wait a second. This is not about like, pay, you're going to pay me to, to put people on cholesterol medications. I don't even know if these people need cholesterol medication, yeah. you know, yeah. there's so much more right, right. Um, beyond the medication. So that was sort of the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm, I'm, I've just about had it, you know? Um, and the more and more I was seeing this there, I was also seeing it in, in my own life. I was dealing with a issue with my son who developed vitamin D deficiency, really severe vitamin D deficiency because his pediatrician told, told us, don't give him vitamin D. And I was trying to be this good mother yes. who was like, I've got to listen to the doctor. I'm not, you know, he, the pediatrician used to say to me, don't be the doctor, you're the mother. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I won't put him on, the, on vitamins. And oh my gosh, he was severely, really, really very sick. Wow. Um, and so it was sort of like, okay, now I get the vitamin D thing is really important. The, uh, this is very important. And I started learning through my, my kids, myself, my patients. And then, you know, I really had to go on my own. I said, you know what, I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to start my own practice. And I did it at a time when, at least in my area, every doctor was joining those big conglomerate, you know, um, you were going the opposite way. Right? <laughs> oh. you know? Wow. And I said, you know what, I got to do what's right. I don't know. I kind of opened my practice and said, I don't know how many people are really going to come to me, yeah. <laughs> but, but this is what I believe in. You know, this is, this is the way that I'm going to treat people. I'm going to spend time with them. I'm going to dig, I'm going to understand the connections for them. I'm going to help unravel their health. And, you know, if, if I see five people, okay, you know, but it obviously, oh. uh, you know, really um yes, grew, it grew and you're known in this world in our world so well and so respected and i love that you share that story and i can so relate it was like same thing i grew up with organic vegetables and we like we'd go to you know um homeopathic stuff or those kinds of things on our home before we go to antibiotics or medication. So I kind of lived that. And then I went to the medical school environment and there's also this very masculine, like you to fit in and be this kind of like strong, tough, not intuitive, not sensitive. And so I kind of like put aside my feminine intuitive nature, which is that cure, not that it's like male or female, but the feminine nature is more intuitive, more wise, more feeling um, more gut instinct versus just the science. And I think the best world is when we blend them both, but our conventional training is so masculine, analytical driven, right? And so again, like you've discovered, I remember a little story that relates to your, um, your being paid for cholesterol in the hospital. I was integrative medical director at the center. And so I sat on a board with, you know, the GI director and the rheumatology director, and then we were all sitting in the boardroom and the medical CEO of the hospital was saying, okay, he's doing charts of beds filled by each department. So how many beds are you feeling as a department in our hospital? How many patients are you sending to the hospital? And of course the gastros were filling them and the cardiologists were filling them. And then there was me with integrative medicine and it was like zero. And I'm like, um, wait a second. It's the same thing that intuitive sense was like, 
this doesn't feel right because I want to keep people out of the hospital and I'm doing really well if I'm zero, but I was actually docked as a department for not getting people filling beds in the hospital because that's what they were tracking. So both you and I kind of came up against the system that we knew like the, the beautiful thing about your story and mine is this intuition in our heart was like, this isn't right. This is not right. And I'm going to risk my life on doing what's right. And I'm going to take that change. I did the same thing. I started my own practice. I moved to Colorado. Same thing. I'm like, well, anybody come, can I do this? Right. So I love your story because it's so, and here we are now, like we are making a difference, not only in our clinics, but in the world, in our small little sector. And it's so powerful when we follow. And I just, as you're listening, you might not be a doctor, but you might be a mother or you might be a nurse or you might be in some profession. And I just encourage you, one of the important things out of this moment in the conversation is you need to follow that intuitive part of what's right and good and right for you and not feel like what you're told is always the right thing. Because we both had these times where we bumped up against something that felt wrong and we changed and we took a huge risk and here we are, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's a powerful message. If you know something is wrong, whether it's your career or your health or whatever, you have to, you have to start listening, you know? And that was the, that was the point where I that started. Was so, and such a great like foundation, even as we start talking about MCAS and stuff, like one of the things I think is so important for us in our practices with patients. And again, if you're listening, patients know when something's not right in their body, right? And the more we can listen and empower them to know that they can actually trust that, that feeling that something's not right, because so often they go to the doctor, they get a basic lab panel on liver, kidney, metabolic panel, and then they get blood counts or they get thyroid, everything's normal, right? And they're told you're fine, go home, there's nothing wrong. And listeners comment here if you've ever heard that, because I bet you many of you listening have heard you're fine, you're normal, and you know inside something's not right, right? And again, part of our message is like listening to the patients. That's a great segue because we deal with these patients who have these kind of medical mystery conditions that many doctors haven't been able to figure out, or they've been other places, I'm sure by the time they get to you. Um, Let's start with just how do you start when you're seeing a patient? What kind of questions do you ask? Where do you go? What are you seeing change in the last few years? Give us a little snapshot of kind of the complexity and what we're seeing now in the clinical practice. Um, you know, well, I'm asking, I mean, I spend, you know, three hours more, you know, with, with patients um, for an initial visit. So the things that you need to find out to really start to understand how their condition got to the point that it got to and what are the, the triggers and the drivers of their condition. You know, I start at their, their mother's pregnancy if they know anything about that. I probably, and I go back even further, if their mother was sick before she got pregnant, again, if they know that, some, some don't, you're adopted, et cetera, but whatever we could find out about what, what may have impacted them epigenetically or, or, or directly, um, whether it's, you know, toxin exposure, their mother lived on a farm where they used pesticides, you know, or whatever. I'm looking at all those everything in the environment. I'm looking at stressors. I'm looking at traumas of various kinds. Um, you know, what we perceive as trauma, what one person perceives as trauma, another per- person may not. So it's really understanding how things impact the patient. Um, and, um, you know, all kinds of exposures to infections. I mean, you know, I live and, and practice in the part of the country where it, it's an endemic area for ticks and tick-borne infections and vector-borne infections. And, um, and so that uh, always comes up and that's something that we always, you know, I always look for. Um, okay, so um, we're looking at all the environmental issues. We're looking at stressors, traumas, um, things that have affected them that, that you, they may not have realized impact them. Um, even things like uh, head traumas, yes. um, concussions, things like that. And then, yeah, the area of the country where they live or the area of the world where they live, you know, I would argue, and I think there's some evidence to support that, you know, there are tick-borne infections or vector-borne infections everywhere in the world. Um, uh, maybe Lyme is more prevalent in my, my area of the country, but that's Lyme, Borrelia, burgdorferi, and there are other strains, and they're all over the country and all over the world. But I'm, I'm looking for exposures. Is it a tick bite? Is it a spider bite? Are they, have they been bitten? Have they had fleas and ticks and, uh, I mean, fleas and lice and other things? Because we know Bartonella can be transmitted by many of these. Yeah. Have they been bitten by animals? 
How they have I love that you're saying that, by the way, I just want to pause because I have seen so many Bartonella spider bites or other types of things that are not ticks and maybe don't leave a rash or don't leave. And I just love that you're mentioning that because people out there are very much thinking of vector borne infections, which is another great thing that you said are not just ticks. And in Colorado, we're supposed to be non-endemic. We have tick-borne relapsing fever. We have soft ticks. We have the Lone Star tick. We have all kinds of ticks that do carry infections. And we're seeing, um, as long as we're testing the right way, which we can talk about in a few minutes, but love that you're asking that question because that's so important. Yeah, I think we've become short-sighted by focusing on the deer tick, yeah. transmitting Borrelia burgdorferi, that particular you know, strain, when we know that the other strains of Lyme or tick-borne relapsing fever are transmitted by different ticks and different, um, different species. And so, um, and then a lot of these other insects um, or arthropods are, are transmitting, you know, Bartonella. Um, and maybe and maybe mosquitoes are transmitting yeah. Babesia, you right. know, or maybe even Bartonella. I don't know if we have research yet to, to support that. So we need to know that. And then we need to know about their pets when they were growing up. We need to know, you know, that they live on a farm or, you know, do they have exposures to being bitten by, by wild animals? You know, you'd be surprised how sometimes um, these things are not, are not, they don't realize it until you yeah. start asking. And they go, oh yeah, I was scratched by a cat when I was five. Yeah. And then I had a lymph node that was swollen. And then, yes. but they yes. just <laughs> like, oh, I know it's going kind of <laughs> Or the patient that comes in and says, oh yeah, I had um, cat scratch fever when I was younger. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> I have it. oh no, you know. Right. Right. So, um, so these things are, you know, you have to draw the memory a little bit because sometimes it's, you know, people, you know, go on and don't realize the, the relevance of, of what has happened. The doctors they've seen, the practitioners they've seen have not really paid attention to it. So it's a really, really, it's really, really comprehensive. And um, you know, I'm also looking for, I mean, there, we have to look at heavy metal exposures, mold exposures. I ask about, you know, where they work and where they live and even in the past, you know, they may not be living in mold now, but maybe they grew up in a moldy place and how that impacted their health, you know, over time. So I love this because you're really laying the groundwork of what's so important is that clinical history is so powerful, right? And often probably like you, um, I'll know in that clinical history very clearly what direction we need to go and I'll prove it with the labs. But often if a good history is taken, you will have almost your diagnosis before you do the testing, right? If you're really listening for those clues. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Wow. Um, what things are you seeing? I, I feel like with a pandemic, an already shaky system has been revealed to be even more shaky and, and less um, uh, robust for these complex uh, chronic conditions like you and I see. What are you seeing, um, you know, like environmental toxicity, an increase in, in these ticks in, 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 social, in areas that are more populated? What things are you seeing in our world that are making this more complex and more cases of chronic illness? Is there any ideas of what might be causing some of this? Well, I think, well, look, on a, I, I guess I'll say basic, basic level, um, this has been a really stressful time, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. There have been economic issues. Obviously now there's, you know, war uh, and people dying and uh, people were in isolation for a long time with COVID. We have that part of it. Um, there was a lot of depression, a lot of um, eating mm -hmm. um, for, for, for comfort. A yeah. lot of people, people in general um, need other humans, yeah. maybe introverts and maybe extroverts, but in general, there's something that, to be said about the socialization of, of humans. And so in isolation, I think that a lot of people um, noticed a shift, right? Yeah. And so, so I think that that promoted, you know, the wrong eating, right. a lot of a lot of alcohol, excessive alcohol use, increased drug use. So we saw a, a, really a, a range of things happen during this pandemic. But then I think that a lot of people also got sick yeah. with COVID. Yeah. Some who were aware they got it, they knew they had a diagnosis, but early on in the pandemic when we didn't have testing right. yet, or we had testing, but you know, maybe it wasn't as, mm -hmm. as people weren't able to get it. I have patients who really feel that they got sick in February of 2020 yes. before lockdown in, in March, and that we can't prove that they had COVID, but they feel that that was the, essentially the straw that broke the camel's back, yeah. that they... Yeah their health declined at that point. And I would argue that much of what we're seeing in terms of the increase in chronic disease is linked to mast cell activation syndrome yes. on some level. Yes. 
And so, of course, I, it's hard because, you know, that's the lens that I see things through, right? But um, there's no question that infections like COVID will trigger mast cells yeah. to activate, even in normal people who don't yeah. have mast cell activation syndrome. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people had some underlying dysfunction that they didn't know about, at least in my population, which is yeah. interesting. Hundred I agree I, with you hundred percent on this because I'm seeing that. And, and I think that this virus, because it was so prevalent and so virulent as far as contagiousness, a lot of people that maybe haven't been exposed to tick-borne or vector-borne infections were exposed to COVID. And so that they've, let's go just to the basics because you wrote a paper on how to diagnose mast cell activation syndrome. So tell us, tell for listeners who aren't super familiar, my listeners probably have heard of this. What is okay. it? Why is it different from mastocytosis? How do you, you know, present? Tell us a little bit about the basics of mast cell activation. Sure, sure. Um, the paper is called Diagnosis of Mast Cell Activation Syndrome, a Global Consensus 2. And consensus two is because there are papers that um, refer to a slightly different way of, of diagnosing mast cell activation syndrome. And so we kind of call them consensus one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and really what we're talking about is what we understand is that mastocytosis is rare. Mm -hmm. It's a cancer essentially of the mast cell. It's a lot of mast cells growing and they're also activated. So patients with mastocytosis can still have the, the symptoms of the activation. But mast cell activation syndrome is basically they have, people have normal mast cells, um, a normal number of mast cells, but they're not normal. They're very, very reactive. Um, and, you know, why that happens, you know, there are lots of theories to that. But, you know, what I would say is that there's some people who are born with completely normal mast cells. And those mast cells, when they get COVID or if they get another virus or Lyme disease or whatever, they will activate. But then when the infection, the trigger is taken care of, they go back to baseline. Patients with mast cell activation syndrome have abnormal mast cells that develop pretty young. Mm -hmm. Usually patients with MCAS have signs of it in childhood, yeah. generally speaking, usually before the, you know, they're 21, usually there's already evidence, mm -hmm. but they may still not be, they may not be that sick and they may be, you know, their symptoms wax and wane. And so they're fine. They don't think about it. Um, and then over time, there are these additional triggers that, that bring it out. And when mast cells are dysfunctional, they are sometimes reacting. They're reacting even when there's nothing to react to. They are releasing chemicals. Part of how mast cells work is that they release these chemicals that are supposed to fight the environment. But in fighting and releasing these chemicals, they're also damaging wherever they are in our own body. Backf backfires is very inflammatory. And, um, and so... Um, over time, people who have under mast cell activation syndrome can have these triggers that could bring it out. And I would argue that for some patients with COVID, they had something, then they got, they had it, they had MCAS, they didn't know it. Yes. They had COVID, they got COVID. And then it, it, it was the trigger that brought it out completely. Um, so, it, so anyway, back, back to the paper. So what we were looking at, what, the reason we published this paper is because there's just really so much... Um, really uncertainty about or, or differences in terms of how people look about, look at how to diagnose patients who have these symptoms, these, um, it is a multi-system sort of disorder. It can affect every uh, organ in the body. And that's the thing about mast cells. They are everywhere, every organ, but they're not in the blood generally. They, they are, are, are produced in the bone marrow. They're white blood cells yeah. and they go from the bone marrow and they go into the tissues, they go into the lungs, into the skin and everywhere they're supposed to go. And that's where they develop. And, um, and so symptoms can, can range, you know, basically every part of their body. So if you have patients who have uh, multi-system uh, symptoms, they have um, what looks like um, activation of uh, or release of these chemicals, which we're going to talk about, then you can, you can look towards making this diagnosis. So our concern was the reason we brought, we published this paper is that this other group, which I have a lot of respect for, put a lot of stock into measuring one particular mediator that uh, mast cells produce, and that is tryptase. Yes. 
Okay. I love this where you're going because I can agree more, which is why it's so important. And I get, I get asked this all the time, you know, even, you know, doctors who are studying this, yeah. no, it's hard to understand, but I think that the easiest way to think about it is this mast cells, um, make tryptase, all mast cells make tryptase. So it's, um, so if you have mastocytosis, you have a lot of mast cells, you'll have a lot of tryptase. Because again, if all mast cells make them and there are a lot of them, there's gonna be a lot of tryptase. In mast, mast cell activation syndrome, it's the same number of mast cells. Yeah. They're normal numbers, but they're just activated. Yeah. So activation doesn't necessarily make more tryptase. Right. So there's a small subset of patients who will have a mast cell reaction and will see an elevation in tryptase. And they'll meet the criteria that was put forth by this consensus one group. You have to have a specific rise in tryptase. Uh -huh. um, and then you can say, oh, you see you had a reaction and so you have yeah. mast cell activation syndrome. But the vast majority of patients will not get to see a rise in tryptase yeah. and they will have normal tryptase at baseline. And so, so many people then will be misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed Correct. if we just rely on tryptase. Um, the other, there's another condition that also causes increased number of, uh, increased level of tryptase, and it's called HAT, or hereditary alpha tryptosemia. Yes. It's a genetic, a very easy genetic test. You, you, can, you can check the number of copies uh -huh. of this of the gene that, that makes tryptase, um, and, and that could be, they could still have mast cell activation syndrome too. Um, but what we did in this uh, article is really outline things you should think about in terms of diagnosing patients, the general um, themes of mast cell activation syndrome, which is you could have allergic disease, you could not, or some kind of allergic phenomena, inflammation generally, and abnormal growth and development. I think of things like increased cysts or nodules or things like that. It's more complex than that, but I'm simplifying it. And then if you have this, then you, these are, this is the way that we approach our patients who have mast cell activation syndrome. And we're saying that sure, test tryptase because sometimes it will give you information. If it's too high, you gotta rule out the hereditary issue and you gotta rule out mastocytosis. But let's look at all these other things that we can measure to help make the diagnosis. Yeah. And that's what we looked at in this article. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a helpful outline for people either to bring to their practitioners, their, you know, their doctors and to say, look, can you read this and ask me for this? Or for, for practitioners to actually read and, and get some more clarity on what they can do to, to try to help to make the diagnosis. Yeah, I love what you framed because this is, again, some of the stuff we talked about in medical school, we've taught in this very narrow box. The box is great, but there's often a spectrum of illness and these things that don't, they don't fit into a neat, tidy box and yet our patients are still suffering and they still fit the general criteria. Um, and I've uh, heard in clinical practice, and I'm assuming your paper, often like the clinical symptoms that they fit. And then if you intervene and they get better, is that part of your diagnosis in this paper as well? Yeah, that's because that's often, I mean, granted that we do, I do the labs just like you do. And once in a while we find, and there's other markers too. Do you want to name some of the other markers that are commonly tested? Oh, sure. You know, really the number one, the most sensitive and specific marker is heparin but it has to be measured in a specific lab. So heparin is a blood thinner, yes. um, but it's made by mast cells in the body in microscopic amounts. Yes. And, um, but it is, if, if it can be measured correctly, we have a lab that we're using right now that I think is really good at picking it up. Um, a lot of the labs will measure heparin because people are getting heparin as a drug. Yes. So they have, to, they have to measure it at very, very small you know, quantities. Um, but heparin is by far one of the best. You, you see an elevated heparin. There's no other reason yeah. why they have an elevated heparin wow. unless they're taking it. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine if they have elevated heparin, the types of symptoms that they may have. So if they're a woman and they're having heavy periods and excessive bleeding, yeah. you can say, oh, maybe the mast cells in the uterus are producing excess amount of heparin yes. causing more bleeding, right? So I think that's like a really, really important yeah marker. Um, but then, you know, we measure something called N-methylhistamine, which is a metabolite of histamine in the urine. We'll measure histamine in the urine. We'll measure uh, leukotrienes and um, prostaglandins. And then, yes. so there are a number of things that can be done in the urine. Mm -hmm. There's some that can be done in the blood. Um, and, you know, sometimes we have to do a couple of rounds of it. You yeah. know, um, I might get a heparin level. I might get a histamine level. 
I like to have two markers to make a diagnosis. Yeah. But while I'm waiting and while we're still not sure, yeah, I'll start some simple things to get start getting people better because sometimes it's going to be hard to make the official diagnosis. Yeah. And again, I am not the expert like you, but I have found in clinical practice, they need multiple things to get it controlled in general. It doesn't take, generally one thing will not, you know, calm the system down enough. So this tends to be a multi-level from herbs and supplements and quercetin and meds. And so we really go the gamut in getting these people controlled. Now, one thing you mentioned that I just have curiosity about, you mentioned N-methylhistine in the urine, which I measure as well, but is that a better marker than serum? Because it feels like serum would go up and down and you'd miss it. Whereas urine you'd collect and you'd see the body. Am I just making that up? Or is that true that you're getting a better, like um, over time measure of the histamine versus blood? Or am I? It's a great question. And the problem is that N-methyl histamine is a really, it's thermolabile. So it's very sensitive to heat. Yes. It's very uh, quickly, it quickly dissipates. Okay. So they have to take their urine with ice to the lab, right? Like it's that important. Right. Yeah. That's right. But think about this. So the patient's done everything properly. They've, they're um, refrigerating every sample. They're, you know, they're doing everything to keep it, you know, cold and, yeah. and so that the, the measures can be, you know, the mediators can be measured, but then it gets to the lab and it sits on the shelf in the lab. We had, we had a patient who told us this, you know, she did everything right. And she handed it over to the lab and the lab like took, took the container out and left it on the counter. Yeah. That's it. It's gone. You know, yeah, exactly. So the, problem, the problem is like to assure that that sample was yeah. taken care of. What I find is that the N-methyl histamine, unfortunately, is not one that I, that I see all of them are hard to see in the urine yeah. because they're hard. You know, it's hard to control all the, all those variables. Exactly. Like, like you said, cause it's right. Totally get that. Okay. The other thing I yeah. thought about was um, how does IgE play into this? Like at eosinophils IgE, those aren't mast cells, but they are related. Is there a relation to elevated IgE or um, elevated um, eosinophils and mast cell or are those two separate issues? No, so I think there's a there's a subset of patients who have more allergic yes. disease. And so to be clear though, there are patients who have allergic symptoms with mast cell activation syndrome, but they've been to the allergist yeah. and they're told they're not allergic to anything. Yes. Okay. And you're like, yeah, okay, you're not allergic, but the mast cells are still reacting to those yes. things, but not through IgE, Got which, it. Is an, which is the allergy um, yeah. immunoglobulin. But there's a subset of patients. I do have a subset of MCAS patients who do have allergy as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and allergy is a mast cell disorder, but they have allergy plus yeah. other systemic it's issues. Kind of like allergy is the umbrella, right? And the mast cells are one thing under the umbrella, but there's other things under that umbrella of allergies that can be. Um, I okay. actually think the opposite. I think MCAS, yeah. or I think mast, mast cells, and I think allergy is one. Got it. And I think there's, there's MCAS, which can include allergy, yes. but doesn't have to include allergy. That's kind of how I think about it. And, and so, um, so we're going to be patients who have elevated IgE. They really do have allergy to certain things, but they also have dysfunctional mast cells that are also reacting to got other it. things. Got it, got it. Um, this you know, is so a great uh, uh, conversation, by the way, because I know patients have oh, time. And, and so thank you for clarifying. Good. I think this is confusing. And I, and I have to say that I've talked to allergists who understand this yeah. either. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, you can definitely have high IgE levels and MCAS, but you can also have low IgE levels. Yeah. Now, mast cells also, they have a couple of jobs. They have a few, actually more than a couple. They have a few jobs. They, they release mediators. They, they also have conversations with other cells in the body. And one of the cells that they often um, interact with are the eosinophils. Yes. And so there's a subset of patients who are more prone to an increased level of eosinophilia, increased level of eosinophils. They can have eosinophilic esophagitis, so EOE in the esophagus. Um, they may have it in the blood. They may have you know, other manifestations. So um, I can't say, I mean, no one studied it, you yeah. know, precisely to say that EOE is MCAS or eosinophilia is MCAS, but I would argue clinically that very many of those patients who have eosinophilic problems um, often have when, when, when you know, um, 
diagnosed have underlying mast cell dysfunction. And so I have patients who have EOE who have done incredible amount of work with their GI doctor. They take the proton pump inhibitors. Yeah. Sometimes they change their diet, but yeah. sometimes they go. <laughs> you know. And then I see them and they're not getting better. You know? And sometimes they've done steroids. And I said, all right, let's figure out why these eosinophils are, are still reacting like this. So there must be a trigger for the eosinophils. And so one trigger is mast cells. So uh -huh. we work on their diet. We work on the diagnosis. We work on the mast cell. And are you putting them on like a low histamine diet or any other things that would be common to obviously probably gluten-free, uh -huh. dairy-free, low histamine? Is that the basic there? That Basic and not always low histamine because okay. that one, that's a whole other yep. uh, thing to talk about because I think there's some uh, discrepancies in different yeah. low histamine diets. I right. think that histamine is not always the issue for a lot of people. You know, if mast cells make over a thousand mediators, yeah, this right. is one, it may not. So, um, but, but that may be, I mean, I think it's very individualized, uh -huh. but from an eosinophil perspective, right? So I may be targeting their mast cells and, and, and I have certainly patients who I have found the right MCAS protocol and their EOE disappears. Uh -huh. And it's like amazing. The GI doctor like thinks something they did and, and it's really, you know, work with the MCAS. But of course, you know, with eosinophils, you always have to think about parasites and there are other things. That other, exactly. I love that you're saying that. I love that you're saying that because what I've seen, and I, that's what I kind of want to ask you what your experience is, is there's people with zero IgE. Like they actually have, there's a new paper on an immune deficiency that's considered just IgE, right? And I was like, oh, because we know about IgG and IgA, but that's actually a new category of immune deficiency, but they still have mast cell issues, right? So what you said could be true because the, the, um, the IgE is zero and yet they still present um, with mast cell issues. My own personal experience was after the mold exposure, I got so sick. And then when I started taking binders, I had hives and all kinds of mast cell symptoms head to toe because I was just going too quickly. Um, so totally get this. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, wow. Okay. What are triggers? So we talked about, obviously, usually there's this genetic predisposition where people are born more prone to this because you could have someone with massive triggers and not get it because they're just stable. Their mast cells are more stable. Um, this goes back to infection stuff. What would you say the most common, maybe top five or six or 10 or whatever things that you see most commonly triggering mast cell activation, like infections yeah. or toxins or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I would say mold is number one. Yeah, totally agree with you there. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I've had my own mold ex uh, exposure and, and issues. And so I can say that there's no question that there's a mold problem in this world, in this country. Um, there's not a lot of understanding. Too many people are living um, in conditions that um, are really, really um, disease promoting, really, really sick. So, um, so mold for sure. And, I, and when you say mold, it's not, it's not an infection, yeah, but it can right. be. Right? Mm -hmm. So some patients who are exposed to mold are, are sick because of the, the toxins, the mycotoxins. Um, but I've certainly had patients who are sick with the actual mold, like get yeah. infestation, let's say of aspergillus, they get aspergillosis. So yeah. it could be both. Um, but so mold is a big trigger, let's just say. Um, I would say from an infection perspective, and again, it may be because I have a very skewed view, and maybe it's the patients I'm seeing, but Bartonella yeah. is number one, two, three, four, five, you know, along with mold. Um, and I think that the issue with Bartonella is that because it's transmitted by so many different things, it's not like Lyme that has to come from a tick. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is very pervasive. It, yeah. it can be found, the map of where Bartonella is found is you know, everywhere, like Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, everywhere. So you imagine that that's going to lead to a lot of cases, a lot of cases that we're gonna see of chronically ill patients. So um, Bartonella, and, and many of those Bartonella patients also have co-infections. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? In the Lyme world, they talk about Lyme and co-infections. I talk about Bartonella, and Barnella's co-infection. So sometimes there's Lyme there, sometimes there's something I else. I <laughs> love that you're saying that though, because I see that in clinical practice too. And sometimes I think when we're in our own little, you know, spheres, we're like, am I, is it just me that's seeing this? But I would just say over and over and over again, Barnella rises to the top as, as one of the biggest things with, and with mold and MCAS and these whole layered mixes that people get, that they get really, really sick. And I would agree with you. I think it's more prevalent than Lyme. Like it really is a big deal by far. And I, I think he is next. And what, because the more we're testing, the more we're under, I'm understanding that if you think about where Bartonella goes, when you get infected, it actually goes to the red blood cells. 
Um, and Babesia lives in the red blood cells yes. and they actually have a symbiotic relationship. Wow. So my understanding is that Babesia can um, uh, cause the iron to sort of, I forgot the word I'm looking for, but they ba it basically forces the iron out of the red blood cell yes. and Bartonella basically eats iron, yes. uses iron for its yes. metabolism. And so, so what I'm finding is that the more Bartonella I'm finding, the more Babesia I'm seeing as well with it. But I think the top layer, I think the thing that's really making them sick, it's both, yes. you gotta deal with both. But, but I think Bartonella ultimately is, is the problem, but Babesia is complicating their, their illness, yeah. I think. I might change my mind. I totally agree. I'm seeing, and again, it's fun to talk to you because I'm seeing this too. And yet I'm always like, is this just me or the same thing that BBC Bartonella is so common and so, and hard to treat. It's not an easy, these are not, you know, just get better in three months kind of, um, wow, this is such great information. What about your paper on chemicals and MCAS? Let's just transition a little of that because you wrote another paper on, and to give, give me the title, give us the title of that one. And let's talk about what the kind of main findings there were for your main. Sure. Um, this is mast cell activation may explain many cases of chemical intolerance. Wow. And it was, we published it with, with Dr. Larry Afrin and Claudia Miller, who is really a pioneer in the uh, chemical intolerance tilt, toxic and induce loss of tolerance world. That's her, that's her thing. Um, and so what we did for this paper, I mean, we had a hypothesis that, um, that chemical intolerance um, may be due to MCAS, that MCAS may be the driver. But no one's really published on it, no one's really looked at it. It's sort of commonsensical to me, mm -hmm. but we you really need to publish it and get the information out there. And so hopefully you can, you know, go beyond and can improve it. So what we did for this study is we had our patients fill out a questionnaire that's been validated. Claudia Miller um, has developed this questionnaire called the Queasy, Q-E-E-S-I. It's a 50 question questionnaire. People can find it online. Um, and I think if they go to tiltresearch.org, they could take the test themselves. I encourage everyone to take the test, actually. It's so, so. Um, and if you're yeah. listening, I'm going to get these links. I will post them. So if you're listening, wherever you're listening, we'll be sure to include all these links plus to your research, your website. So just don't worry Good. if you're listening in your car, you'll have access to whatever <laughs> you need. Yeah. So keep going. So there's, there's a lot that. of information. Yeah, yeah it's so a lot of that website real quick. And then the Queasy test is the name of the, um, the questionnaire, right? Right, so it's tiltresearch.org. Okay. Um, I think Queasy might, they may have their own um, website now too, I think. So anyway, um, Q-E-E-S-I is the questionnaire. There is an abbreviated questionnaire called the Breezy, B-R-E-E-S-I. -E -E and the Breezy is three questions. And it's pretty, um, it's sort of a, a, it's a nice sort of overview. It's very clear if you take breezy test and you answer at least one question as a yes. Have you been exposed to paint? You know, do, are you sensitive to paint fumes, tobacco, gasoline? You know, there are a bunch of these questions. And if you answer yes to any of them, the recommendation is that you go on and, and do the queasy. In our practice, we just said, look, our patients are already sick. We know that they're, a lot of them are chemically, chemically sensitive. So let's just give them the queasy and see what happens. So what we did was we took their queasies and we matched them up with their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So if they had nasal activation syndrome and they had a positive queasy, a high mm -hmm. score on the queasy, we were looking at, at the numbers there. Like what is the correlation between a positive MCAS diagnosis and a positive queasy. And we found, yeah, large percentage of our patients clearly had that. You can have, we think, we don't know because we haven't proven this yet. Could you have chemical intolerance tolerance and not have MCAS? I guess it's possible. I, I, you know, I can't say that everyone, all those patients have MCAS yet because we haven't proven it. This was our hypothesis and we have a theory and we're supporting our theory, but we don't, we don't you know, know 100% yet. And I would argue that you can have MCAS and not have chemical intolerance. And I have patients who, you know, they may be sensitive to some things, but they really are not profoundly sensitive. Yeah. You know, I have MCAS patients who come in with perfume on and I think, well, that's crazy, but yeah. you know, they, that doesn't bother them, right? But there are other things that obviously they're reacting to. So, um, but anyway, so, so I think this paper though is one step further in understanding why patients get to the point that they get to. So. Um, we know that some people are chemically intolerant, some people are sensitive to EMFs, some people are sensitive to noise and sound, and, 
And so we start to understand the mechanism. What we want to understand is why, what is it about the, we think it's mast cell driven. And so what is that process that leads to that? So that's kind of what the paper cover. Yeah, that's what, this is so exciting because um, I am not a researcher, but I have such um, appreciation and admiration for you putting out these papers, because this is where, again, we need to take medicine, just bring the data. We know we see what we start with is observation, right? Which is what you're saying. We saw this and we thought maybe there's a connection. So then let's start to look at the connection and, and write the papers and then continue to prove it out. So thank you for all that you're doing there. Um, there is one other paper I want to mention before I let you go that you, you talked about is the post HPV vaccine and what you're finding. You want to share just a little bit about that? Yeah, this was a case series. Okay. Um, and it was again, based on our observation. And, and look, I'll say this, that, um, you know, one of the things that was really important to me um, once I was sort of in the functional medicine world and treating patients, it became very clear that we need to publish. I feel really strongly about that. And especially when Dr. Afrin joined my practice, because he's a researcher and because he's coming from that academic background, um, I think that the two of us sort of saw this opportunity. We have to get this information out there. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're existing in our own worlds. Well, you know that, right? We yeah. practice and do our things and we notice these things. We hear other people noticing them, but we need to convince the, mm -hmm. the greater medical community yes. Because we can't help, we can't help all or all the patients. Right, so right. we need to train others. And so I think publishing is a really great way. So that was my little segue. Like I just, I'm really excited to be doing this. I didn't think I would be doing this, but I am, and I'm so excited. So, um, anyway, in this um, paper on HPV on the HPV vaccine, what we have found there there are there's some literature already to support this that there's an increased risk of POTS, uh -huh. postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, after the HPV vaccine. And, and so there's, you know, people are studying that and, and trying to understand that. And so what we're starting to understand in our practice is that POTS is very much related to MCAS yes. in a subset of patients. Yes. So can you have POTS and not MCAS? Yes, I think there are patients who really don't have MCAS and they have, let's say an autoimmune driven POTS, but a fair number have an overlap mm -hmm. of mass activation postural orthostatic cardiac syndrome. And I'll say um, EDS may be the trifecta that kind of yeah. closes the, the loop. Um, so, so if our hypothesis is that many POTS patients have MCAS and HP, the HPV vaccine was causing POTS, yeah. what, if, what if really what was happening was that the HPV was actually exacerbating underlying MCAS? Yeah. So the key is that it's not causing MCAS. Right. But that, um, like I mentioned with COVID, mm -hmm. it's a trigger that yeah. brings down an underlying susceptibility. Yeah. And so what we found in our case series is that many of these patients who presented um, with POTS and then, and then finally we diagnosed them with MCAS, yeah. if you go back in their history, it's very clear that they had signs of something early on uh -huh. when they had the vaccine. Uh -huh. And whether it was the first one or the, after the third one, they went on to develop uh, POTS and, and significant disability. And then, and then finally, we were able to put it together and they had MCAS. So this is sort of bringing to light the fact that there may be something sp specific yeah. about the HPV vaccine. We, maybe we can generalize this to other vaccines. It's not anti-vax, very much pro-vaccine, totally. but it's about, um, it's about trying to understand individuality in medicine. Yes. You know, it's always about, you need this, right? Yes. And I would argue, yes, I think that, that to prevent HPV related right. cancers, yeah. very, very important. I love we, saying that because we're I so, so agree. And I, I think of it as like, I've always told patients, I completely believe vaccines have a place. I am hundred percent behind them. But if you take a very large population with any intervention, you're going to reveal, it's almost like I always uh, relate it to a cardiac stress test. You have a 65 year old male walking along. They're fine with no symptoms, no problem. You put them on the treadmill and maximize their output of their cardiac output. And all of a sudden you reveal a deficit that was what they were walking around with underlying, right? You reveal something that was hidden that could have caused death in that person. Same thing as we're talking about here, you have this massive population, most people are totally fine. But when you stress them with an adjuvant or something else, all of a sudden you reveal, oh, they had MCAS or oh, they develop POTS. So I love that you're clarifying because we need this. And again, we we need um, we need to be able to do this in a way that's 
uh, good for our populations and helpful and also know the few canaries that maybe would react to it, right? Right. So it's, it's helping um, patients be recognized that, you know, that these things happening to them are not because they're crazy. Right, they right. <laughs> that, that doctors say to patients is mind blowing. But, but also I think that, that the way science has to go and medicine has to go is we have to be able to start to identify the patients yes. who should be getting the vaccine yes. or shouldn't be, you yes. know, maybe there's a way, okay, or they need the vaccine and they have underlying MCAS. Can we, um, can we stabilize their MCAS? Can we give them mass cell yes. targeted therapy and get them ready for the yes. vaccine? Yes, I, I just love this and so important work and it's so, so needed in, in all of these realms because we need the voices that are um, advocates for the canaries, the one in a million, one in a thousand, one in 10,000 that are going to have reactions to these interventions. So thank you for your work. Um, I'm just imagining too, as you were talking, as we end here, uh, this big map, like ideally we'd have this map and I can just see like EDS and POTS and MCAS and like someday we're going to have a map of how they all kind of fit together and maybe the genetic predispositions. And, and I feel like with your research, thank you because you're making this map for us. You're actually helping to create a map for the new medicine, which is a medicine of personalization that goes to the individual because we're all so different. There's no one size fits all. There's no N of one, right? There's no real N of one as far as this, this perfect patient that fits the criteria. So this personalized idea of medicine is really where the future of medicine is going, I believe. Yep. I can't, I couldn't agree more. Wow. I, um, I'm so, uh, so delighted about this conversation. I've learned so much in it and where can people find you? Where can people find more information on the papers you published? Um, tell us wherever any other links that would be helpful. Sure. So, um, I have, a, a my practice, um, website, is um, aim, A-I-M, center, um, pm.com. Uh, so it's, P, it's personalized medicine, so we kind of abbreviated it. So okay. aimcenterpm.com. Um, I have my own website, drtanyadempsey.com. Facebook is Dr. Tanya Dempsey. Um, Instagram, I think, is Dr. Tanya Dempsey. Um, and so we're trying to update all those places with all the stuff that we're publishing. And of course, I've done, you know, a lot of, I don't have my own podcast, but I've done a lot of podcasts and we have those all, you know, available as well. So you're good. I think well, that's a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. I will, like I said, I'll include all those links and thank you for your tireless efforts. Um, just so appreciative for the work that you're doing, Dr. Dempsey. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Dr.